Games rated E to M. Welcome to Nintendo Power Podcast. This episode, we dive into details about Xenoblade Chronicles 3 that series fans will definitely want to hear and share how the game is also the perfect starting point for new players. My name is Chris, and this episode, I'm joined by Ethan from Nintendo Treehouse. Hi, Ethan. Hello. And Matt from the communications team at Nintendo of America. Hi, Matt. Hey, hello, Chris. How you doing? Great. Thanks for joining you guys. And, you know, to get this episode rolling, um, we're going to dive into what I think many RPG and adventure game fans might call one of the biggest games on Nintendo Switch this year, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And personally, I got really pumped for this game when I watched the recent uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Nintendo Direct, which had a ton of cool information about the game's story and new features. And for anyone who hasn't seen that Nintendo Direct yet, I'd strongly recommend checking it out. Um, now, I've played a decent amount of the previous games in the Xenoblade Chronicles series, but Ethan, you've been helping to manage this latest game here at Nintendo of America for a long time now, and Matt, you're a super fan of the series, so I'm betting I can learn a lot more about Xenoblade Chronicles 3 from our talk here today, but before we do a deep dive into all the new things fans can expect to see in the latest game, Ethan, how would you describe the series in general to people who maybe haven't experienced a Xenoblade Chronicles game yet? Mm hmm. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, it, it has that series, the Xenoblade Chronicles series has a lot of hallmarks that I think RPG fans love. So, you know, lengthy adventure, lots of story, interesting characters. Um, but the thing that really sets this series apart for me is uh, the game worlds that, that they offer and the combat system. Um, so, you know, Monolith Soft, which is the developer of these games, has at this point in time kind of made a name for themselves. Um, and they really, you know, for those game worlds they create, and they really, I think, put a flag in the ground with the first Xenoblade Chronicles game that, that came out on Wii. Um, stun, you know, stunning people with these worlds that, you know, in that game were built on the bodies of these gigantic uh, titanic creatures um, with, you know, you know, natural environments and and your enemies and and towns, you know, existing on on those creatures, um, these really wild landscapes, and that has um, been something that's continued through the series um, with Xenoblade Chronicles X and Xenoblade Chronicles Two on on the Nintendo Switch, and then also continues again um, with this most uh, recent uh, entry in the series. Um, and then um, the battle system for me also kind of sets it apart. A lot of times in, in RPGs, you get turn-based battles that allow you to strategize and, and think about your actions per turn. And the Xenoblade Chronicles series has gone a different direction, um, and, and that's a kind of a common thread that runs through the games as well, in that battles are real time, you know, as you're exploring these these fantastic environments, you see an enemy, you approach the enemy, and you seamlessly engage in combat with them. Um, and then characters auto attack while you are planning out um, using specific uh, techniques called arts uh, that give you, you know, different advantages or let you use special abilities. Um, and Everything kind of happens in this very smooth, real-time flow. And then when combat ends, you kind of seamlessly again go back to exploring the world. Um, and so those are two of the things that I would call out that kind of set set the series apart and really make it unique, uh, even within the RPG genre. Absolutely. And Matt, what is it about the series specifically that drew you in and made you such a fan? Yeah, thanks, Chris. You know, it's really building on some of the things you were just saying, Ethan. It's the, the worlds are so big, they're so capacious, and there's so much to do and so much to see. And as you're moving through the worlds, there's so much to surprise you. Because, you know, I mean, like a lot of games that are really big, you can move through the story and you can see, you know, all the wonderful things that the game has to offer, but, but not everything that's there. And you can move off and explore and just find these wonderful, you know, sub-adventures or, or have things sort of pop up with characters um, that you weren't expecting. So it's, you know, the word I guess I would use is there's this kind of emergent fun that just happens uh, organically in the series. And then I, I can't not plug the, the music um, in the series too, because as you're doing it, the sounds that you're hearing and, and the music, uh, you know, that's been created for the series, every single title 
I've just been so impressed by, you know, the instrumentation, um, uh, just the variety, the thoughtfulness of the music. You know, it can go really down tempo. The, the stars come out at night and you're just kind of almost awestruck by the beauty of the moment and, and the music is matching the sound and the mood, you know, and then it gets very upbeat. You're in a battle and, and uh, it, it just, it's all just really interesting and constantly keeps you engaged. I just want to throw one little note. Um, you know, we we build off each other. And, you know, we were talking a little about about this series beforehand. And one thing I found is that one person has a comment and it springs a comment. And, you know, in my mind, we go back and forth. But something Matt just mentioned about the music. Um, you know, one thing to call out, I think, is that the folks making these games, whether it's on the music side or, or the development side, have a long pedigree, you know, in, in making RPGs even prior to the Xenoblade Chronicles series and have worked together for a long time. Um, so on the music side, we have someone like Yasunori Mitsuda, um, who's kind of a famed composer um, of Japanese uh, games, including, you know, titles like Chrono Trigger way back in the day. And he and uh, the series, you know, you know, uh, I guess we would call executive director um, Tetsuya Takahashi have a long history of working with each other. So Mitsuda-san had music on the original Xenoblade Chronicles game, but has continued to work and, and has and has music in Xenoblade Chronicles three as well. So that's another kind of through line for the series. I thought was worth pointing out. That's awesome. That's really cool to hear. And uh, you know, just from my perspective as someone who has sunk quite a few. Um, uh, you know, dozens of hours into some of the previous games in the series, I feel like I've still, in some of these games, only scratched the surface. Um, and so I'm still kind of working through them and uh, it's kind of games that I perennially, you know, kind of come back and continue, you know, checking off side quests on. Um, but something that really draws them to me because I've never been such a, a big RPG fan myself that I have to check out a large number of those types of games. But I will say that as someone who would normally be more interested in and kind of um, more action adventure type experiences like the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, those kinds of games. Um, I get a lot of the, that similar feeling here where there's such an epic story, obviously you'd, you'd kind of expect that from a great RPG, but also as you guys have been talking about the vast world to explore and the kind of more um, freely flowing um, combat, I guess, as you described it, Ethan, um, just feels a little bit more at home for someone like me. So I really do think that this is a game that really can go as deep if you, uh, as you want with a lot of those types of systems where you can really um, kind of micromanage certain things if you want to play the game that way. But also on more of a surface level, I think you can just enjoy it as a great adventure. And um, it's something that uh, really, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, people who, if you're not necessarily traditionally an RPG fan, uh, maybe still give this one a look. And if you are an RPG fan, I think there's a ton of that type of content to look forward to. Um, so, you know, you gave us, uh, uh, you know, a demo, um, Ethan, and, and that's something that really struck me was just how much uh, I wanted to get into the game because of the world and just because of um, kind of the epic story that was unfolding. And then everything else, uh, uh, um, you know, looked great too. So um, talking specifically about Xenoblade Chronicles 3, 3 now um, and what it adds to the series formula, you know, maybe for people who are familiar with those past games, what are some new things that you think really stand out here for those types of fans, Ethan? Mm -hmm. So I want to get to that. But something you just said um, made me think of something else uh, that I want to mention first. And then I'll lead into, you know, things that I think this game is adding to it that, that previous fans may may appreciate. But you, you brought something up that's close to my heart, which is, you know, when I fell in love with these games, and Matt, you're probably the same way, you know, I want people to experience them um, who you know, may not normally play games like this because the worlds and the stories that they that they offer are so unique, you know. Um, so one thing I want to emphasize about Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is that if you are someone who has never played a Xenoblade Chronicles game, do not be dissuaded by that 3 at the end of the title because I am actually of the opinion that this may be the best entry point in the series for new players. Um, which might, may sound crazy for a game with a three at the end of it. But the reason I think that is, one, the story hook. Um, you know, I won't give anything away, but when you start out, this game starts you off and running from a story perspective in a way that just makes you want to know more. So, and it, and it doesn't require you to have any previous series knowledge of, of the first two games. Um, so that's fantastic. You know, new players can really hit the ground running and... 
I feel will be like pulled along by the story and like I've got to know more. Um, and I feel like that start from a story perspective is is perhaps the strongest it's ever been in the series with this game. Um, but there's also a couple like really, I don't know, I, I think handy things that, that new players will enjoy. Um, uh, and, and we'll make getting into the world of a Xenoblade Chronicles 3, you know, game, you know, like this that, that might be daunting otherwise um, a little bit easier. So you've got a handy kind of navigation feature um, that, that you can bring up at any time that will point you toward your next objective. So you may be placed in this massive world and like Matt said, have the freedom to go off and explore wherever you want. But when it's time to get to, you know, the next main thing you're supposed to do, you have a line that will, will point you there if you want it. Um, there's also, you know, difficulty levels. So if you're somebody who might be feel a little intimidated by engaging with this like real time combat, you can, you know, temporarily, if you want, set the difficulty to easy. Um, and then if you get over that hurdle you were struggling with, you can set it back to normal or, or hard if you want. Um, so I love that, you know, we kind of tailored the experience for people that way. Um, and there's also really, really handy and, and well built out like tips systems for people. So, you know, the if you've seen if you've seen video of these games before, and in, especially during the battles, you may know that Xenoblade Chronicles Three likes you know, in, or the series in general likes to put a lot of stuff on screen. Which again, if you're a new player, you might look at that and go, "How do I parse all of this?" Well, there's a lot of stuff to help you understand um, the battle system. You know, from tutorial messages and training drills that you can take part in, which are new to to this game, um, and that stuff is layered into the game for you. So you're definitely not expected to, you know, know how to do all that stuff uh, from the get-go. And the game really does kind of on-ramp you in a gradual way. And then by the time you get all of the gameplay features, you know, working uh, in unison, you really feel, you know, powerful. And and it's, uh, I think, something that new players will, will really enjoy. So I just wanted to, like, kind of get that out of the way because I'm always trying to bring people into the Xenoblade Chronicles tent. Um, and I want to make sure folks know this is a fantastic place to jump into the series. Um, and now I'm, now I'm talking a lot. But I'll just quickly briefly <laughs> mention um, a couple of things that are new to the series that I think... Uh, experienced fans will like as well. So the first thing that comes to mind for me that we've shown a bit in trailers already is the Ouroboros. Um, so this is a uh, kind of really powerful and large form uh, that two of your characters can transform into. They kind of combine into. And um, these uh, Ouroboros characters can be used in battle and, again, make you feel really powerful and, and you're pulling off really incredible moves and going toe-to-toe with some of the larger enemies that you you fight, face in this game. Um, they look really cool. They, they remind me of kind of mechs from, like, you know, robot anime, but, but not quite. They also look kind of to be living, so they're very mysterious but also really cool looking. And then the other thing um, that I would call out as, as new and that experienced players are going to enjoy digging into is the class system. Um, so, you know, you'll meet characters along your adventure uh, that will introduce new classes um, that your, you know, your characters, you have six main characters in this game. And these new characters you meet will add a new class uh, that any of your six characters can then learn. Um, and there's a lot of freedom that comes with that as, as new classes come in to your repertoire. Uh, it expands the type of gameplay you can, you can have and the type of party that you can build with your six characters and gives people a lot of freedom that I think they're really going to enjoy exploring. But yeah, that, that's enough for me. That's my spiel about, about both new players and experienced players, but wanted to get that stuff in there. <laughs> No, that's great. And there's a lot more, um, you know, I'll be hoping you can, you can share with us in just a moment, but, but Matt, you know, you were, uh, you were a little bit in the same boat as me. I'll, you've got a lot more serious knowledge when we sat down to play that demo the other day and, and kind of dive into the, the very beginning of, of the, the full build of the game. But, um, but you were also seeing this kind of at the first, this particular game and this particular part of it at the same time as me for the first time. So um, what jumped out at you? Maybe it was some of the features that Ethan was just talking about, or or just anything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and it's funny because I'm I, I, I'm I'm such a super fan that I want to know as little as possible. Uh, you know, just just have as uh, have as little information as possible because I, I love enjoying these things. Um, you know, as purely as possible. But the the uh, I think the things that that leapt out at me. I mean, one of them, Ethan, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Is there, there's always a natural incremental. You know, I, th- I think, you, you know, you see the changes between the games. You see the ways little things are refined or maybe adjusted or changed in, in, in different ways. And, and I felt like, you know, within the battle system, things 
are have always been so wonderfully tactical and 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 you can you have to think sort of on your feet there's a there's it always feels to me like there's a little bit of a real time element and and that's always been fun and and really enjoyable in the prior titles i can see the way they've made little adjustments in in 3 it again it feels to me like like the systems are they they're easier to read and see and track some of the things that are going on so that when you're making uh, decisions, really important decisions in the heat of the moment, that it, it's more meaningful. It feels more, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of understanding why the thing is happening. Um, so I think the battle system just looks very interesting. I cannot wait. And I've only seen the beginning of it, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to have more exciting things to tell us about here as we go. But the other thing that I absolutely love, and it's, it's sort of a hallmark of, uh, you know, Takahashi-san, uh, I, I think as well, is in his prior games is that he has such interesting and mysterious stories. And what seems at the beginning, you know, and I, I got that sense just watching the introduction with you, what seems in the beginning like sort of almost maybe a, uh, you know, a straightforward idea or a construct always seems to have, you know, multiple almost fractal things happening as the story keeps going. So I don't know what those are, um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> that there probably will be some interesting uh, uh, things to come in the story. And, and again, it, it felt like, uh, you know, again, the most, the most mysterious of the Xenoblade series that I've, uh, the Xenoblade Chronicle series that I have, have experienced so far. So yeah, very much. And, and, you know, speaking of story, that seems to be um, one of the cooler things. I mean, because I think Matt and I, we were both instantly hooked by what we saw. And Ethan, you were speaking very highly. I mean, you've, you've experienced the whole story, <laughs> speaking very highly of it. And, um, you know, the basic setup and scenario, I think a lot of that was um, kind of teased or revealed in the uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Nintendo Direct. So, Ethan, for anyone who maybe hasn't seen that yet, is there a, a general summary you could give that just kind of lets people know, like, why people like us are so excited to sure. engage with this story and these characters? Sure. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because there are scenes that I will not talk about right now, but at the very beginning of the game, which I showed to you guys when we when we demoed the game earlier this week, that are kind of, like I said, really grab you from the get-go. And we haven't shown any of that stuff. And I'm really excited to see what people, you know, people's reaction to are, are to some of the first things the game shows you, um, both for new fans and folks who, who are more experienced with the series. So that's something I'm looking forward to. But yeah, in, in that Nintendo Direct, you know, we were... We kind of split the time between, you know, world and story and, and battle information. But from a story perspective, you know, one thing we've we've shown is that this game, it, it does for the first. Well, one thing I'll mention is that there are six, like I said before, six main characters. Um, and, and what that means, something from a story perspective in the fact that each of these six characters is going to kind of have a fully fleshed uh, out storyline you know, through the, through the game. Um, you'll learn a lot about each of these characters. Among, among the six, Noah and Mio, who are representatives of their, each, you know, each, uh, the, the nations they belong to, which are Kevis and Agnes, um, they're probably kind of at the core of our story. Um, and Kevis and Agnes are two nations that are warring, uh, and have been for a long time. We learn, um, with soldiers, um, you know, on both sides, kind of bound in this struggle against each other, and they're fighting to survive, we, we learn. Um, you know, it's one of our things we've said about this game is live to fight and fight to live has kind of been a, a slogan, and you'll learn a little bit more about why that is. Um, but I love that this game offers you six characters to really learn about, and they all kind of have their own unique personalities, but they all play a pretty substantial role in the story as you go through. Um, and you also have a, you know, that translates into the battle system as well when you have six characters that you get to control in battle, uh, one at a time, but you can freely switch to control any of them, um, which is something new for the series, which has previously had you controlling like three main characters um, during battle. Um, but our, you know, as you guys saw when we were playing early, um, we don't start out with a full party of six. Um, we, we start with, with the three characters, uh, Noah, Lands, and Uni from the Keves side. And there's going to be an event um, a little ways into the game that will bring them into contact with the other three characters, Mio, uh, Senna, and Tyone from the Agnes side. And at first they start as enemies, and then 
there is an event that happens that, you know, requires them to work together. And from that point on, um, they are, you know, allies and and companions. Um, and, you know, seeing seeing that, you know, bringing together of the two sides is really cool. And then they are kind of on a mission, um, you know, from that point on to expose other people in their world to the truth of what is actually happening, um, you know, behind the scenes of this conflict uh, that Kevis and Agnes have have been involved in. Um, and meanwhile, they've also learned how to become Ouroboros forms. <laughs> um, and so um, that, that whole kind of learning what the true nature of the conflict is and then being, you know, having this really strong motivation of informing others and, and being on this, like, this mission of, uh, you know, you know, letting others know what's going on in the world and trying to to save it is uh, a really a really strong, like I said, a really strong through line for the story that I think is going to propel people forward. Absolutely. And, you know, when we were watching some of those um, very cinematic sequences, whether they were story sequences or just kind of the very cinematic way that that battles can unfold some sometimes in real time, um, you know, Matt, I know one of the things that you and I were both kind of appreciating were the visuals and, uh, and how everything looked... Uh, at least to our eyes, you know, I haven't gone back and really compared side by side, but things looked, uh, you know, kind of a kind of sleeker and maybe a little bit more polished than ever before. Um, you want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that and kind of what you know how it was hitting you in the moment? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's amazing what this team is able to do uh, in all the games. You know, I mean, going back to to Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, where they, you know, they they uh, uh, you know sort of upgraded it or remastered it, and and just just looking at that world having come from you know, the, the, the original version on the Wii. And then Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was just, again, it was uh, amazing to see how much that they were managing to, 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 you know, to pull these huge worlds. I mean, you stand on the edge of a cliff somewhere and you're looking out at, at something that is maybe, you know, 10 minutes of running and walking to get to, and it's really there. I mean, it's actually present on your system at that, you know, in, in that moment, you're in that world. And then to see, you know, again, and once again, the refinements moving into Xenoblade Chronicles 3, uh, it's just amazing, the crispness and, uh, you know, the, the depth of, of everything, the, the coloration. They have this wonderful, um, the Xenoblade Chronicles games have these wonderful, I don't know how to describe this, so forgive my language here, but this is sort of almost like neon lighting through, you know, like the, the, there's the sword in Xenoblade Chronicles, the Monado, and and, and uh, you know, the, the, the Aegis and Xenoblade Chronicles 2, you know, the, the, the sort of lighting in, in, in uh, that, that symbology. And you see that again all through Xenoblade Chronicles 3. And it's just beautiful to look at this synthesis of sort of the organic and the mechanical, um, the way the worlds are lit. Uh, I know I was talking to you, to you guys yesterday that one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I see this goes all the way back to, to the original Xenogears that, you know, um, uh, Takahashi-san worked on uh, that there seems to be a real interest in the way light sort of interacts with the environments, or at least my sense of it is that, and as I'm seeing that in Xenoblade Chronicles 3, it's just next level, and I cannot wait to, uh, to see all the different sort of scenarios I'm going to stumble into where I'm just going to be sort of awestruck by the, by the way the game looks. Yeah. I, I'll just add on to that, um, that, you know, again... What, you know, there are a lot of thematic through lines um, that run through this series. And although Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is its own brand new story, right, it's, it's, it's not really connected to, you know, again, no, no previous requirement for play on those first two games to jump into this. But you are getting a game that's made by a team that now, you know, has made worlds like this. And, and had the experience in lighting them and and coming up with those those really effective lighting accents and coloration things. So you're working with, you know, you're getting a game made by veterans of creating these types of worlds and telling these types of stories. And they're really firing on all cylinders at this point. And I, I think, you know, it, it's it is pretty stunning to see it's like oh, every time they make one of these games they refine it's clear you know that they refine what they're doing and and uh, just get better at it basically one kind of refinement that uh, jumping back to combat for a minute that uh, that really um, seemed helpful to me was that you know you talk about how you know once you've you fully ramped up and you've got all of your available options open to you in combat. Um, you know, there's quite a lot, and you, of course, don't have to use all the options for every battle, but for people that do really want to 
dig in there and use all the different features. There's a lot there to consider. But in some ways, I feel like it's um, certain things are maybe a little more streamlined or more obvious. And what I'm thinking specifically about is the roles that your characters play in combat. Um, in this game, they're kind of clearly defined as either attackers, defenders, or healers. Uh, Ethan, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, this is something like you've you know mentioned that was present in, I think, every Xenoblade Chronicles game in some form or another, but it's really kind of been codified here. Um, so, you know, I mentioned there are a lot of different classes that you can, um, you know, you start with some. Uh, each each character has uh, their own class. Um, and then you'll acquire new classes by meeting um, these new characters as you make your way uh, through the game. But each of those classes will fall into one of those three uh, roles, uh, either being an attacker or a defender or a healer. Um, and, you know, that that has taken different forms in the previous games. You know, with we, we saw Blades, um, you know, uh, in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Um, and and player you know characters have played those roles, but in in this game I think it's it's made very clear some of the equipment is designed around like oh this equipment is very good for an attacker whereas this equipment is clearly designed for someone who's a healer, and you know so the attacker's job during um, during battle is to deal a lot of damage right and um, their job is to be the main ones trying to take down the enemy, um, but they can't stand up to uh, a direct assault from the enemy. So the defender, somebody who's playing a class that would fall into the defender category, um, it's their job to keep the enemy's attention or aggro on them, um, draw the hits. They can take, you know, they can take all the the, the damage, um, and they have techniques that keep the enemy focused on them while the attacker is dealing damage. And then the healer, um, you know, also kind of falls into like a support class. So they can they can heal and they certainly do that and keep people on their feet. But they also can, you know, create zones where uh, anyone standing in that zone will get a, a bonus to their attack or, you know, to their, you know, ability to dodge attacks. So they buff the party as well with a variety of really helpful things. And... Like I mentioned, you only control one character directly during battle at a time, but it's fun jumping between characters of different roles. So, you know, I think I mentioned to you guys when we were playing the game earlier, like if I see one of my characters is really, you know, low on HP and my healer may be off on the other side of, of the battle, you know, on the other side of the enemy, you know, supporting someone, I can take control of that healer, bring them over to my ailing character and make sure to get the heal off on them. So in that way, I am, you know, jumping a lot between which character I control during battle uh, and kind of playing maestro, you know, to this symphony of, of battle that's happening um, between the three different roles that my characters have. Yeah. And then um, I don't think we've touched on this yet, but there are also heroes. So you could have a seventh character that you actually don't control join in the, your, your party for battles yep. as well. Yeah, yeah. So these these hero characters are the characters I was alluding to that you learn new classes from, um, and you know I won't I don't want to share too much about um, how you meet them or you know how you uh, get them into your party because that's something really cool for for players to discover. But these hero characters. There are a lot of them, <laughs> and they are really unique, um, and each have their own personality, um, and so they they weave into the story as well um, in some really cool ways. But they also, you know, give you a new class to play with. So you get to a certain point with the, with with a hero where they will their class will become available to you, and it'll still fall into being either an attacker, a defender, or a healer class. But it'll give you some new way to play one of those roles, um, you know, and uh, and so there are variations on a theme with each of those three big um, roles that you can play. And so, you know, getting a new class is, is a really cool thing because it's like suddenly you have access to new specific arts and then any of your six characters can learn that new class. Um, and so you really find that the more classes you get, the more freedom you have to build the party that you that you want and, and will suit your style of play. You know, so if you want somebody who wants to be a little more conservative and make sure you always stay safe, you might have a party made up of, you know, mostly defenders and healers with one attacker. But if you're somebody who's, you know, really aggressive and, and wants to take down enemies, you know, the quickest, maybe you'll have four attackers in your party and one healer, one defender, something like that. And it's really up to the player um, to decide how you're going to, you know, 
you know, make that balance work for you. You made me think of something there, Ethan. I want I want to jump in. Also, I wanted to just recognize that Symphony of Battle is such a great phrase <laughs> <laughs> that it, it's all it could also be like a subtitle for for the, for this game because it's yeah. so it's so so wonderfully descriptive of what it's like. But but um, you you were just making me think about when you were showing Chris and I yesterday. Uh, also, something that that's unique about this game, and I'd love to hear your you know your, your take on it. But um, we learned yesterday that you don't have to pre pick your the party member you're going to fight with because as you're playing uh, out the battles, what can you do now in the game? Um, so you can not only can you you know swap between characters on the fly during battle um, to really take control um, and like I said, um, feel like you you know you have these six characters and they will be um, you know doing things automatically when they're not the character you're controlling, but that ability to jump between them really does give you, you know, for folks who, who for folks who want to, um, you'll really have the ability to control from like a fine tune, uh, you know, standpoint, what's exactly happening at what different time during the battle. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because you can also, it's, it's just kind of a neat thing. You can control which character you are, um, running around the world with when you're not in battle. So, you know, if you have a particular character who's your favorite, um, you know, Noah may be the protagonist of the game, but maybe Uni is your favorite character. Well, you can always have Uni be the character you see running around, and then she'll be the character you're controlling when a battle begins um, and you're off and running. Um, but like Chris mentioned uh, before, this is something I think that's kind of interesting about the game's battle system that I think makes it really flexible for both people who aren't as experienced with RPGs and people who've played every game in this series, which is that I was just saying, you know, you someone who's really into advanced tactics and um, plays a lot of games like this um, will be that person who is switching characters on the fly. Okay, now I'm controlling my attacker. Whoop, got a heal over here. Now I'm going to bring my defender in to, to, you know, defend my attacker. But if you're someone who just wants to stick with one character... This game will totally let you do that. You know, in almost every battle, um, you know, you'll be able to make your way through with one character um, and 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 sticking with that character while your other characters are doing their, you know, kind of scripted routines and, and being controlled by the game. Um, so I think that is kind of like stands for a lot of what the game's battle system has. It offers you so much to dig into, so much, so many customization options, but it doesn't force you to play the game that way. Um, so they're there if you want to engage with them and they'll really make you powerful and like open, open up, um, you know, op opportunities for, you know, controlling, you know, all your characters and like defeating really difficult enemies. But you can also make your way through a large portion of the game's battles just by sticking with your, your arts, sticking with one character, if that's your style. And I love that it gives different players those different options, uh, even though on the surface it may look very complicated, um, this game is actually quite simple to play if if you're someone who just prefers sticking to kind of the more mainline gameplay features that it gives you in battle. So definitely, that's how I'm going to start for sure. But if it's anything like uh, you know, Xenoblade Chronicles, the first one um, that I'm as I become more confident mm -hmm. and kind of go through the little mini tutorials as they come up, I find that I'm able to handle a lot more than I I could at the start of the game for sure. Yeah. Well, I think probably the most challenging thing about this game is probably just how hard it is to stop talking about it because there's <laughs> just so much to talk about. So, uh, but in the interest of time, you know, um, let me just ask you both if you have maybe one final thought or thing you'd like to share about this game before we move on. And Matt, maybe we can start with you. I, I guess it would just be Chris to say that I, you know, I love these worlds. They're always different. They're always unique. They're never the same. And that's the thing that I think I love the most about these games is that you can have spent hundreds of hours, you know, playing the, the prior games and the, the each installment feels like its own thing completely. You know, it, it has its connection points, but you can experience it just as this completely self-contained package. And so I am uh, thrilled to be able to do that when it, when it comes out. Yeah, and and for me, you know, I did spend a lot of time kind of, you know, come play your first Xenoblade Chronicles game with Xenoblade Chronicles 3, you know, and, and I do truly think this is a great place for new players to start. I will now play the other side of the coin and say, if you are someone like Matt, who knows this series inside and out, um, who 
has played, you know, these games maybe even more than once, um, the previous games in the series, there are going to be a few things in here you are definitely not going to want to miss from the get-go, things you will notice, um, things you will see, callbacks to previous games, uh, references to characters, to locations. So keep your eyes out for those. And I'm, I, that's the thing that I'm super excited to watch people talk about once this game is available for everyone to play are all the things that people spot, um, you know, those experienced players. Um, so, you know, that it's, it's something that, that is, it, I kind of like to think of it as an icing on the cake or, or a bonus. Um, again, certainly not required for anyone. And you'll be, those things may be just more mysterious elements for you if you're a newer player to the series. Uh, but I, I want to see people start to make the connections and, and spot um, the different things they may recognize uh, as experienced Xenoblade Chronicles fans. So I'm looking forward to that. That's great. I'll probably be doing some of that in reverse, you know, like like uh, experiencing something in this game. And then the next time I go back and play more of the previous games, realizing that there was that kind of connection there. So that's great. All right. Well, I'm just going to have to stop it there until uh, <laughs> I can finally get my hands on the full final game, which I just cannot wait to do. And uh, next, we're going to move on to Player's Pulse. And as always, recently we asked Nintendo fans on Twitter a few questions just for fun. And first off, we asked, which of the following Nintendo Switch sports events would you choose to excel at in real life? And the options we provided were bowling, chambra, soccer, or tennis. And Matt, let me ask you, if, if, how would you answer this question? If I could magically make you a, a, a pro at either one of those sports, bowling, chambra, soccer, or tennis, which one are you going with? I'm going to go with the one that I probably couldn't pronounce uh, to save my life. And just because I think it sounds interesting, I'm going to go with, and apologies for mispronouncing it, uh, sh uh, Shambara? <laughs> Shambra? That's pretty good. I've said Chambra. I'm not sure if <laughs> even I'm saying it the right way. Basically, swords. Yeah. Which seems yeah. like it would be a pretty cool thing to know, even if not in the most practical to your everyday life. <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, I would, uh, personally, I would, I would probably would say bowling. I don't know, just cause I love bowling in the game so much. Um, being Ethan, a pro bowler, you? being a pro bowler is always like when you do find yourself at a bowling alley, if you're just able to hit strike after strike, I mean, that's always a, a really cool party skill to have. So, <laughs> For sure. um, I, I'm going to have to go with Chambara as well. I think I did fencing in high school a bit. It's not quite the same thing, but, um, I also just like my friends and I had um, kendo kendo swords growing up uh -huh. because we could wail on each other <laughs> with them um, in a, in a relatively safe fashion, um, and we thought we were really cool, you know, uh, even though we weren't. Um, but yeah, I I would love to be you know a renowned chambara master. I think that would be really cool. So I'm with that'd Matt. be great. And for the record, I would I fully endorse having uh, televised Chambra uh, events on those <laughs> giant platforms with the pool below, yes. just like in Nintendo Switch Sports. Well, it was pretty decisive, actually. Uh, the 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 fans who voted on Twitter overwhelmingly uh, went for uh, bowling at about forty oh, percent, and wow. uh, and then honestly, the rest of the sports mm. are pretty evenly split. Um, I think that probably, like for me, was just a carryover from bowling being such a popular sport in the uh, the video game. Yeah. All right, next up uh, was uh, we asked, which summer job would you take? And the options were hose down Delfino Plaza from Super Mario Sunshine, um, Helian Chef, or maybe Hylian Chef, not sure if I can say that right. Basically, <laughs> cooking up those delicious dishes from uh, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. If, if Bill Trinan were here, he would strictly um, correct you and say that it was Hylian. <laughs> there you go. I'm not, I'm not quite as strict as Bill, but I will tell you that our official pronunciation is Hylian. Well, I've learned more and more on this episode. Uh, the next option was Salmon Run uh, from Splatoon 2. And then also um, Skyloft Soup Delivery. Anyone who's played um, uh, a certain Legend of Zelda game can remember having to deliver some pumpkin soup uh, on the back of their, their trusty uh, feathered companion. Um, so, Ethan, I'll start with you this time. Uh, which would you choose? Host down Delfino Plaza, Eileen oh, Chef, Salmon Run, or Skyloft Soup Delivery? These are all great options. Um, I would I would like any of them. I feel like uh, so, you know the summer theme would go maybe best with with Delfino Plaza, but I have a really a special place in my heart for Salmon Run. As chaotic and maybe kind of 
for foreboding as it can be, um, working for a mysterious uh, bear as your boss uh, who is <laughs> deploying you on on part time jobs of of dubious means. Uh, it's still super fun, and and I love Salmon Run, so that would be my choice. Awesome, Matt. What about you? Yeah, I think I'm I, I'm going to go with Hylian Chef, and I think I sort of pronounced it maybe halfway right there, but part of the reason is because I absolutely, it was one of my favorite things to do in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was just cook, it, it, you know, to, to my heart's content. But I also have to say that in my household with my three young children, they actually uh, would would call it sort of, uh, there, there's the Hylian Shield in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which they call the Master Shield because of the Master Sword, and they don't, they couldn't pronounce highly and to save their lives. So, <laughs> so Bill would have to correct your children as well, is what I'm understanding. <laughs> no, that's, that's his right. pronunciation was correct. It was great. <laughs> oh, really? But yeah. I mean, is there a master? Oh, oh, master, yeah, yeah, yeah. Master yeah, Shield. No, we don't call it. We, that is the Hylian Shield, yes. But yes. the pronunciation of Hylian, spot on. All right. Well, cute children can get away with it. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. I, I'd pick uh, Hose Down Delfino Plaza because why not? It's a beach community and you're getting to, to squirt water at things, basically. And that is uh, what the fans chose as well. Um, although it was much more evenly split this time around. Pretty much everyone uh, had a, was a fan of, uh, of, uh, of one of these. And then finally, the final question that we asked, uh, kind of in honor of a game that I've been enjoying and I'm going to talk about more later uh, that came out recently, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Shredder's Revenge. We asked, who's your top turtle in TMNT games? Obviously, there's been a lot of these over the years, and more often than not, you get to choose uh, whether you're going to be Donatello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, or Raphael. I don't know if you guys are big turtle friends from, for, uh, or fans from way back, but do you have a, a pick? I do. Um, I am a big turtle fan from way back. Uh, I... Okay, so I grew up here in Seattle, and we had this fantastic comic book shop, and I still remember the day I discovered the original, like, not for TV. I was too young probably to read them at the time because they're kind of violent, but those oh, original— I, I had those too, yeah. Yeah, those original TMNT um, uh, comics, you know, were made a really big impression on me. Um, and I actually had a turtle growing up that I named Leonardo. So nice. um, that would be my choice. Yeah, Leonardo was always kind of— Always kind of my favorite. Oh, I awesome. feel I feel I feel like the odd uh, guy out because I, I somehow missed a lot of the TMN and, and T stuff. So I'm gonna have to go stand in the corner and wear the dunce cap <laughs> because I, miss, I know what a phenomenon it is. If I had to pick by name, I'd probably pick uh, uh, Michelangelo just because I like. And I probably mispronounced that there, but yeah, that'd be my pick. <laughs> well, you know, Matt, uh, it turns out that you match the fans. <laughs> uh, they picked Michelangelo as well, although this was the narrowest of uh, of kind of the division of votes here because every turtle was kind of in the the mid twenty percents. Oh wow! Um, and uh, you know, I would have said Donatello back in the day because I remember in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game for the NES, he had that great reach with the bow staff, which was pretty helpful. But um, in the new game, I've been playing Michelangelo a lot with his uh, nunchucks, so uh, I can't uh, fault the fans or you for that pick either. <laughs> Nice. Great. Well, that's it for the polls. And next up is Nintendo Power Game Club. And as usual, I asked each of you to recommend a game that you've been enjoying and to tell us a little bit about it. And the games that we're going to be talking about are um, Hades from Supergiant, Graveyard Keeper from Tiny Build Games, and the aforementioned Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Shredder's Revenge from Tribute Games, and uh, Dot Emu. So, Ethan, uh, would you like to start? Uh, tell me which game you chose, you know, mm -hmm. what it's like, why you like it, and why you'd recommend it. Yeah, sure. Um, so I chose Hades. Um, this isn't a super recent release, um, but and, and a lot of people may have played it, but if you're like me and you hadn't checked it out yet, I would definitely encourage you to. Um, I'm somebody who grew up, you know, really loving folklore and, and mythology, Greek mythology especially, and... You know, that's something I've actually been doing with my daughter lately is reading her Greek myths and introducing her to some of those classic tales and all of the gods and goddesses that, that populate those stories. And she has loved sitting alongside of me um, because as you go through, you know, a run of, of Hades, you'll get these boons from different gods as you go. And unlike the myths, which were kind of these set tales, right, that are kind of written you know, everybody kind of, once you know that myth, you know that myth. And, and the gods have personalities in them for sure. But in this game, you get to interact with them directly. Um, she loves the artwork that each god or goddess has. Um, so you get to see, you know, Supergiant's 
artists take on these classic um, Greek gods and goddesses. Um, but then they're so inventive and they add to the story as well. Um, so from a story perspective, it's it's really fantastic. Um, there's so much writing that went into that game that it's, it's staggering to think of um, how much um, – just how much story they 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 put in uh, to that game is, is really staggering, and then gameplay perspective as well. It's really really rewarding um, to see you know what you get to keep with you from run to run, um, what you know what is you know you only get to use uh, on a specific run, and then it goes away, uh, and then the way your character builds up in strength um, as you go, and you know you slowly find yourself. Facing off against a boss that you thought, you know, was near impossible originally, and now that you're stronger, you're able to to take it out and eventually, hopefully, uh, make your way out of Hades, um, which involves facing off against your father. Spoiler alert! But you know, I mean, <laughs> it's it's in the title, so yeah. And pretty much from the beginning, it's understood that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, is yeah. Get out from under dad's shadow. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that game when I played it. And like you said, the story was great. The characterizations, it was really fun, like you said, to see the kind of new spins they put on those classic characters. And then just the cycle, the, the kind of uh, re repetitive cycle of the gameplay where each time you're kind of getting a little bit better, learning a little bit more, or maybe upgrading in certain ways, and you're able to get a little bit farther or take a different path. And and um, and just kind of explore that world. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. All right, Matt. What about you? What game uh, would you recommend? Well, I am. I'm going back, Chris, right now to a game that I, I I've started a couple of times and always run out of time to to play, but that I've I've been really. I knew it was going to be really interesting to get into, and I, now I'm really getting sort of well into it. It's a, it's a big game. It's a really wild and uh, astonishing game in a lot of ways. But it's called Graveyard Keeper. And it's, you know, it looks sort of like a, it's got that 2D really kind of Stardew Valley aesthetic going on. Uh, and, and it feels a lot like an RPG, uh, but it's also a little bit of a sim. And it's kind of funny. I think the, the way they describe it is the most inaccurate medieval cemetery sim <laughs> um, that you've ever played. Um, but it, it's a, it's a uh, as it sounds in the title, Graveyard Keeper, I mean, at the very beginning, your character... Uh, in sort of the introductory sequence, I'm not giving, I'm not spoiling anything here. You know, suffers an unfortunate accident, but the afterlife that you go to is you're a graveyard keeper, and now your job is to sort of go through and manage this cemetery. So think, you know, a little bit like in a game like Stardew Valley, where you know you're you're managing, uh, you inherit a farm, you're managing a farm, and then you meet all these characters, and all this really interesting emergent storytelling happens. Except now you're in in a world where you're you're you, know, you have to sort of go through and clean out a graveyard, and you start meeting these strange characters, very quirky. Um, the humor is is very mordant and and, and a little <laughs> dark, but also funny at the same time too. So this is going to be a, a kind of a wildly uh, you know backwards reference here, but for anybody who remembers the Ultima games mm -hmm. on PC. Um, especially one called Ultima 8, The Black Gate, where those games, you know, they, they could be very serious, they could be dark, they could be very interesting, but they always had this f really funny sense of humor, little bits of, of sarcasm here and there. So they, the writing is just wonderful in the game, and as you're going through the systems, the gameplay systems are quite intricate and, and allow you to do, um, you know, in terms of all the, of, the, of the inputs that go into how you, you're building systems that allow you to then unlock other systems, uh, and then there are all these subplots that emerge that are kind of based uh, around, uh, there, there's some DLC out, one's called A Game of Crones. You know, obviously that's a reference to Game of Thrones. And then uh, uh, another DLC is called Stranger Sins. Uh, very <laughs> topical with, <laughs> with Stranger Things having uh, concluded lately. So, so yeah, and then just quite, quite long. So if you really like management simulations in the Stardew Valley vein, but you're looking for something with a little bit, you know, more of an edge to it, uh, mm -hmm. you can't go wrong with Graveyard Keeper. You definitely got my attention when you kind of uh, made the Stardew Valley comparison because I remember spending a lot of time in that <laughs> game and really enjoying it. Yeah. This yeah. is Stardew Valley for goth kids, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, I kind of teased it before, but my uh, pick this uh, episode was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Shredder's Revenge. Uh, this game is very much an homage to those old school arcade style side scrolling beat em ups, of which a couple of, of the most classic ones were based on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, of course, you get to choose from the four turtles, plus, you can play as uh, their master, the rat, Splinter, or April O'Neil. 
And uh, it was also announced and revealed in the trailers that you can unlock Casey Jones. So pretty much anybody you'd want to play as from the classic kind of cartoons and, and 80s era, 80s, 90s era of Turtles is there. And that includes um, non-playable characters as well, a lot of the different bosses and foot soldiers and everyone that you come across in all of the levels. And I really like this game because, uh, like I said, it, even though I kind of uh, uh, had already kind of moved on into to, to games and and other older teen stuff by the time Turtles, Turtles hit really big in the 80s, um, I still have a certain fondness for it. It was just so prevalent in the culture back then, and, and I played so many cool video games featuring those characters. Um, so it, it, it definitely has that nostalgic feel, and I imagine if you were a big Turtles fan maybe back when you were a kid, uh, it's just that much cooler because from the opening animation to the kind of new version of the classic cartoon theme song that they use at the beginning and, and kind of remixed versions of music throughout the game, um, it really does feel like it is the ultimate game you could have wished for back in that era. You know, it has the old school pixel graphics, but kind of, um, you know, pumped up to a degree you probably wouldn't have seen back then. You know, it's just a beautiful looking game. Yeah, so it looks colorful. so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those games that it seems I've, – I've only just really seen it. I haven't played it a ton yet. But it reminds me of those – there's kind of a series of games. I feel like The Wind Waker, Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker falls into this um, where you have the original version and then you have like an, an HD version or, or a new type of game, you know, like this one. And – you're like, oh, man, this looks exactly like the original. And then you go back to the original and you're like, yeah. oh, no, this looks quite a bit better than the original. <laughs> <laughs> but it but it makes you feel like you're back in the roller rink, right, playing that arcade game, that, you know, TMNT arcade game. So Yeah, well put. It's kind of like how you remembered that experience looking and feeling and not so much what it really looked and felt like back then. Um and uh, but one cool thing is, is compared to the, the strictly arcade based games back then, of course, this being created as a, as a home game, it has, uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot more depth to it than you might expect. I mean, not crazy amounts. It's still just a very straightforward action game. But compared to an old action game here, you have kind of a, a world map in between stages, somewhat similar to the world map that I, I recall you had in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle games for NES, if anybody remembers, um, remembers that one, um, you know, to kind of go between uh, stages. There's also little side areas you can go to to complete certain subquests for certain characters. You can level up each of your characters, so it's a good, uh, a lot of replay value there even after you beat all the levels to keep um, leveling up each character their maximum level, which kind of unlocks extra lives for them or, you know, extra abilities. Um, and uh, so even though I, I beat it here recently, I plan to continue playing it just because I want to get everyone maxed out. And it's fun to play online. I, I played through half of the game, I'd say, on single player by myself. And then I played um, through the rest of it with a friend online. And, um, you know, couch co-op works just as well. In nice. fact, I think you can play up to six players. Oh, wow. Um, so it's a lot of fun that way. So, you know, anybody who likes, definitely if you like old school arcade mm -hmm. style brawlers, and if you like that nostalgic pixel look, uh, this is definitely a game you're going to want to check out. Obviously, if you're an old school Turtles fan, this is a can't miss. And then I think anybody who just enjoys fun action games, you can just sit down and kind of either just chug through or, or play in little pieces at a right. time. Just fun multiplayer games that you can play with friends and family. Um, I think uh, I think anybody should check that game out. Mm -hmm. And uh, all right, so before we finish this segment, I also want to mention that we went online and asked uh, fans to recommend a favorite game or, you know, a game that they've been playing and enjoying recently. And we had a lot of great responses. Um, I just picked a few of them. First up from Greg, who said, Klonoa has been an absolute blast. I never got to play the original, so I'm crazy excited for the opportunity to explore them now. The soundtrack is absolutely wonderful, and I enjoy the mix of classic point A to point B side-scrolling with a mix of ways to explore and collectibles to find. Yay. Definitely second that one. Klonoa makes my heart great. happy. I love yeah, I know Klonoa. you're a fan of that series, too, yep. but... And then uh, D4 Gaming said, I finished up Death's Door recently and started at Mario Plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle because I wanted to expand my gaming horizon into tactical RPGs. I heard it was a great place to start and it hasn't disappointed so far. Definitely agree. I really enjoy Mario Plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle. Um, Mentaleum San, uh, interesting name, I hope I pronounced that right, said, I'm having a blast playing through Bayonetta in preparation for Bayonetta 3. I know it's an old game, but this is my first time, and yes, of course, Bayonetta 2 will be next. And then finally from Marie, who said, I just finished back-to-back -back playthroughs of Xenoblade Chronicles 
uh, Definitive Edition and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 in preparation for the release of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Wow, that I've is also had fun. <laughs> it is. I've also had fun playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge uh, with my spouse and kids. So another uh, recommendation there for Turtles. And I thought it was interesting that so many, uh, and of course, uh, not just these, but the other responses I saw, um, kind of came from people who were preparing for upcoming games by going back and playing the previous versions, which I think just really shows you how many cool sequels are coming out this year. Yeah, definitely. So a lot of good stuff there. Thanks for everybody who uh, contributed. And next, we're going to move on to the Warp Zone quiz. And of course, this is where I'm going to give you guys clues to help you identify three games that came out 10, 20, and 30 years ago, all during the month of July or actually June as well, uh, which I'm counting here since we didn't include June games in the last quiz uh, that we did. So you guys ready? I think so. Stepping yeah. <laughs> into the warp zone. Hopefully. Here we go. All right, so 10 years ago in June of 2012, the clues are Nintendo published a game for Nintendo DS that was a special collaboration between Tecmo Koei and the Pokemon Company that combined two longtime game series into a unique turn-based strategy game that challenged you to become a warlord, strengthen the links with your Pokemon, and build your kingdom. Any guesses as to what this game was called? Oh, boy. This is targeting one of my weak points, which is like <laughs> Pokemon series, like mainline Pokemon series spinoff titles. Oh, man. Uh, I know I'm going to like... Say, did you say... Co oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ethan. I was just going to say I'm going to kick myself once I know the answer <laughs> to this. So I, I will you say, say that just a little bit here more. It was a crossover between the Pokemon series and uh, the Nobunaga's Ambition series. I, I was just going to ask if it was uh, the Nobunaga's uh, Ambition series because Koei, Koei Tecmo, and I do play those games, but I, mm -hmm. I didn't play this one, and I can't think of the name, but I know what you're <laughs> yeah. talking about. I can see the game. I can yeah. see... I remember what it looked like, but I cannot remember the title. Awesome. Well, it was Pokemon Conquest. Oh, oh dang it. Which is yeah. a little bit of a deep cut. It's such a unique yeah. standalone yeah, yeah. game, and I love it for that. It's pretty yeah. cool. I would love to see more of those. Um, yeah, that that is a really cool like mishmash of, of genre and IP. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. Love, I love that you asked a question about a, a, that level of sort of uh, genre fidelity in that particular area, because that is those are, those are popular games. That's the Dynasty Warriors. Warriors you know, company for, for others who, who don't know Nobunaga's ambition, but um, not as well known, I yeah. think. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a series that goes way back, though. All right, speaking of way back, uh, 20 years ago now, in June of 2002, the clues are, Way Forward published a game for Game Boy Color that mixed Metroid-style side-scrolling platforming action with the colorful, cartoony world of Guardian Genies, and whose ponytail-whipping heroine went on to become an <sighs> indie gaming icon with cameos and titles like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Any guesses as to what this game was? So I don't know the subtitle, right, if there is one, but this has to be Shantae. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I don't yeah. think there was a subtitle. The just first Shantae. the first game, the, that Game Boy Color game, right, was just Shantae? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's actually available on Nintendo Switch. Actually, I think pretty much every uh, Shantae game ever made is now available mm -hmm. on Nintendo Switch. There's like five core games in the series, yep. I think, not counting some special editions and some DLC, so... That's pretty cool. I also wanted to note that note uh, that that same month in June of two thousand two, uh, Eternal Darkness: Sanity's Requiem came out, uh, which Whoa. was a favorite of mine on, mm. on GameCube. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Thirty years ago now. This is July of nineteen ninety two, and the clues are: Nintendo released a jet ski racing game on Game Boy that made a good splash on the handheld with fun top down action, like a water based version of the NES classic RC Pro Am. But the game's sequel would go on to make a much bigger or make much bigger waves on Nintendo 64, leading to a third game at the launch of the GameCube. Any guesses? I'm gonna let Matt. Do you? Uh, I'm think. I, uh, I'm thinking the the N64 jet ski wa is Wave Race 64, of course. But you're this is what this is the sequel. Well, this would have been the Game Boy game, the and game I think Boy. in the clues I've already okay. said came before the N64 came before. game. Okay, yeah. No, I'm gonna. Is it gonna just originally? Is it just originally titled Wave Race? That's it. Yeah, yeah, you pretty much had it, Matt. It's uh, just yeah. Wave Race. Yeah. Nicely this one done. blew me away. I didn't I didn't realize it. I mean, I, I've known about this game for a number of years, but uh, I didn't learn about it until after I played Wave mm -hmm. Race 64. And I was like, what? This existed? Because I was such a huge fan of uh, Wave Race 64. I, and you're not alone, right? Like, that game is really beloved. But there are a couple, you know, series um, that got their start, you know, uh, on, on Game Boy kind of, like, quietly. Um, and, you know... 
like that Kirby Game Boy game um, kicked things off in a lot of ways for Kirby. Uh, and we all know Kirby's gone on to do many, many other things. But yeah, like Wave Race, who who would have thunk it? It like started in yeah. black and white on, on <laughs> Game Boy. So One of my favorite Game Boy games is, because uh, I was such a big fan of, of Kid Icarus on NES, mm-hmm. is Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters, which mm-hmm. didn't come before the NES game, but was the sequel, basically, that uh, I think a lot of people... Uh, you know, they've heard of the NES game, but probably don't know about the Game Boy. Right. Yep. All right. So those were the main questions, but I have a bonus question here and I'm going to play a sound and see if you guys can guess what it's from. I'll play it twice. So if you do know it off the first try, please hold your answer so we can give everyone listening a chance to guess. Okay, here we go. Good luck. And here it is again. Good luck. All right. Any guesses as to what that is and what it's from? It's got to be Star Fox, right? That's right. Yep, it's Star Fox. Sorry, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, no, no, no. Good. Good for yeah, you. Matt's like done. Matt's like I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I had it. I had it. You got it. Yeah, it's the sound that plays uh, right before you go on a mission. And actually, this sound has appeared in other versions of the game too. But I think this one in particular was from Star Fox sixty four. Mm, okay. Great. So to finish things off, we're going to move on to game forecast. And this is where we're going to take a quick look at some of the Nintendo Switch games that recently released or are coming soon. I'll just read through the whole list right here, and then we'll check back with you guys in just a minute and see uh, see what might be on your radar. Um, so start to start with, uh, we had on July 12th, uh, Time on Frog Island from Half Past Yellow and Merge Games. On July 14th, we had Spider Soars from Way Forward and Zell from Tiny Roar and Assemble Entertainment. On July 19th, we had Endling, Extinction is Forever from Hero Beat Studios and Handy Games. On July 21st, River City Saga, Three Kingdoms from Arc System Works. On July 22nd, Capcom Arcade Second Stadium from Capcom and Live Alive from Nintendo and Square Enix. Then on July 29th, we have Digimon Survive from Bandai Namco and Xenoblade Chronicles 3 from Nintendo. On August 11th, we have Cult of the Lamb from Devolver Digital. On August 18th, RPG Time, The Legend of Right from Anaplex. And finally, on August 26th, we have Pac-Man World Repack from Bandai Namco. And uh, some of these games are available for pre-order right now. Um, Ethan and Matt, is there anything here that you're especially looking forward to? Matt, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing that we might, uh, we're probably going to have to have some overlap here. But for me, it's definitely Live Alive. Uh, just very interested. I mean, just big fan of, 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 the, of the art style that, that is going to be used in the game from, from prior games like Octopath Traveler and, 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 and such. And uh, I you know, don't know anything really about it, uh, and, and, and I'm excited to find out about it. It's one of those games where, again, you know, people who, who maybe imported it or played the import version w- will be familiar with it, but I don't, sadly don't speak Japanese, and so I'm extremely excited to be able to experience it finally. Um, uh, in a in this sort of souped up version that looks very very cool. So yeah, Live Alive for me and Ethan. How about you? Um, I am also super excited for Live Alive. I also am a big fan of retro arcade stuff. Um, so I can't remember, Chris. You might have to remind me the exact name. But the second uh, arcade collection from from Capcom that's coming. All right, that's Capcom Arcade Second Stadium. Um, yeah, so there was a first one of those, which was, it kind of puts you in a virtual arcade, you know, and you get to kind of go down the different arcade cabinets and choose which one you're going to play. There's all these options for different screen features or, you know, if you want it to just, you know, fill your your TV screen or, or make it look like you're playing in an arcade cabinet. Um, but the uh, this second round of those has a bunch of like deeper cuts um, from Capcom's arcade history. So there's like a bunch of different brawlers and beat 'em up games that you may have heard of or like maybe walked by in the arcade back in the day, but never 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 played. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I will just mention as well, um, like uh, Chris, uh, one of the commenters from from previous. Um, you know, that we got a response on a recommended game. I do want to call out a recent release, um, Klonoa Fantasy Reverie, um, which is, you know, remastered, re- you know, remade versions of the first two Klonoa games, um, which I loved, um, and I felt like, you know, never quite enough people played those games. So 
that was a, a recent release, um, you know, on Nintendo Switch, and I would love it if people would go watch a trailer or something. If you need a game that is just heartwarming but also has really unique and satisfying platforming gameplay, um, I would really encourage you to check those out. It includes both of those those first Klonoa games, so... Yeah, that's another recommendation for me. I definitely second that. And I'll also add that there's a, um, I found there's a demo for that game. Oh, nice. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I downloaded it myself the other night and uh, and I haven't hit the end of it yet, but um, oh, I was cool. playing through quite a good chunk of it and it was bringing back some of those great Klonoa memories. Mm-hmm. Just the, you know, it's so satisfying just, you know, when the, the whole base mechanic of just grabbing onto the bad guys and then kind of throwing them down the path mm-hmm. and hitting other things. So lots of fun. And I, I also am, I will third the recommendation of Live Alive or rather the excitement for it. Um, that, uh, like you said, Matt, is a game I always kind of heard whispers of having, you know, been great in Japan, but it never came over here until now. I love that kind of Octopath Traveler graphic style. And I love the idea of going to the different eras. So I'm um, definitely going to be checking that out. And then I also wanted to mention Spidersaurus, which kind of sounds kind of silly, but um, you know, WayForward has is, is got a good track record with this kind of game. They actually made Contra 4 for, um, what was it, for Nintendo DS, mm-hmm. which was great. Um, yep. And so that kind of run-a-gun style of gameplay uh, is something that they, they've got a good track record with. So I'm going to be checking this out. I've uh, only just played like the very first couple of minutes of a tutorial level of it so far. Um, but it looks like it has that same kind of action, but with a lot of tongue-in-cheek uh, humor. So that's another one that's on my radar. And with that, Ethan and Matt, I'll let you go. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I've had a blast talking about Xenoblade Chronicles 3 and everything else. Yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Thanks so much. I love chatting with you guys. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris and Ethan both. You're awesome, and I really appreciate uh, the good conversation. Yep. Awesome. Well, Thank we're going to have to do this again, though, once we've once we've had time with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. <laughs> we're going to have to <laughs> we're going to have to meet up for lunch or something and talk about all of our theories and 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 story, you know, prognostications and things like that. So Look forward to that. I know it's <laughs> I, it's like I got to check out with you guys like you know what did I miss in this scene what were yep. the callbacks or what's the deeper <laughs> meaning <laughs> yeah. awesome right we'll see you next time cool bye bye that's it for this episode of Nintendo Power Podcast if you have any comments or questions you'd like us to consider answering on the show you can email us at nintendopowerpodcast at noa.nintendo.com also we always appreciate it if you can leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you get new episodes as soon as they're ready Thanks for listening and keep playing with power.